for the audience trickle in before we start our exciting webinar for you today. Uh, just some housekeeping items while we wait for people to sign on. Um, as a reminder to please put your questions in the question and answer box. We will not be checking the chat box during the webinar. Also, this will be a recorded webinar and will be able to be viewed on our Neonatal Hemodynamics Research Center's uh, YouTube page. Um, if you like everything that you see there, don't forget to, to sign up um, and click that you like it. Also, we have a Twitter handle that we are using that we will post some of the answers to some of the questions that we are not able to get to after the webinar. Um, we will put all of that information in the chat box for you. And as a reminder um, for those in the States as well as internationally, we do have a neonatal hemodynamics uh, special interest group that's a part of the American Society of ECHO that enables you to interface with some of the leaders in our field. If you're interested in that, please contact me later and I can give you information on how to sign up. And with that, I would like to invite our two amazing moderators uh, to come on and start off our session. Thank you, Suvik and Pearl. Thank you, Lauren. Um, my name is Shovik Mitra. I'm an associate professor um, at UBC in Vancouver, Canada. And it is my absolute pleasure to co-moderate this session on um, cardiovascular medication selection in, in neonatal cardiomyopathy with uh, Dr. Pearl uh, Chatmetakul, who is an assistant professor in neonatology um, at Oklahoma Children's Hospital. Now, this is a topic that is critically important as it relates to critical outcomes such as death in the shorter term and also long, longer term cardiovascular health, but for some reason doesn't seem to get the attention it deserves. Um, and always, at least to me, remains a black box when it comes to its uh, medical management. So to shed some light on this topic today, we have an excellent and diverse uh, panel of experts. I will start by introducing the panelists followed by our speaker. So on the panel today, we have uh, Jenny Shefford, who is an assistant professor of clinical pediatrics at uh, USC Keck School of Medicine and attending neonatologist at the Fetal and Neonatal Institute at CHLA. We have uh, Dr. Danielle Rios, who is an associate professor of pediatrics and hemodynamics specialist in the division of neonatology at University of Iowa. And we have Alan Groves, who is an associate professor in the Department of Pediatrics and Department of Medical Education at Dell Medical School at the University of Texas at Austin. And last but not the least, it is my absolute pleasure to invite our guest speaker today, uh, Dr. Amir Ashrafi, great friend of mine, cardiac neonatologist at Chalk Children's Hospital with formal training in both NICU and pediatric uh, cardiac intensive care. He's also the founder of the Neonatal Heart Society and the chairman of my absolute favorite meeting, the NeoHeart, Cardiovascular Management of the Neonate. So we have Amir, take it away from here, my friend, Hi, on yeah, cardiovascular management of cardiomyopathy. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, let me see if I can get this up. All right, it's an absolute pleasure to be here, everybody. As you heard, my name is Dr. Amir Ashrafi. I want to thank uh, Shovik and the uh, moderators and the entire panel. I also want to thank the NHRC for the invitation to speak here today. The title of the talk I was given was Cardiovascular Medication Selection in Cardiomyopathies. But I was going to make a small, subtle change to this uh, title. It is such a broad topic. I'm going to focus my talk more on what we do and don't know about cardiovascular medication selection in acute cardiomyopathies in neonates with structurally normal hearts. I'm not going to be talking about chronic disease, and I'm not going to talk about uh, older pediatric patients or babies who have congenital heart disease during the postoperative period, just acute disease with structurally normal hearts. Now, the first time the term cardiomyopathy was used was in a lecture in 1956 by a gentleman by the name of Dr. Wallace Brigden. About a decade, uh, maybe 12 years later, the World Health Organization piggybacked on this and gave a very general um, gave a very general definition as myocardial dysfunction of unknown etiology characterized by heart failure and cardiomegaly, 
another dozen years later was the first classification scheme that came out and was separated into dilated, restrictive, and hypertrophic. And over the course of the next several decades, there have been multiple iterations to get more and more sophisticated in how we categorize different types of cardiomyopathies. And while this is great for adults, in the neonatal world, most of these classification schemes are not particularly relevant. And if you were to take a look at cardiomyopathy in the NICU, again, structurally normal hearts, the lion's share can fall under the original 1980s classification of dilated, restrictive, and hypertrophic. So this is how we're going to separate the talk out today. I'm going to hit each one of those in that order. And let's first start with dilated cardiomyopathy. As the name suggests, these are babies who've got enlarged chamber size with poor systolic function. And the etiologies of these uh, most commonly is going to be a viral myocarditis. You can have ischemic and uh, genetic causes. I'm not going to spend too much time going into the diagnostic algorithm to identify what the exact etiology is, because the premise of this talk, like we've talked about, is acute management. And so when we talk about cardiovascular med medication selection, what's really important is what do we see on the echocardiogram? And here's an echo that I think most of us are familiar with, apical four-chamber view. This is the view that everybody likes. It's easy to identify the anatomy. You've got the two atria on the top, right and left ventricle on the bottom. And there was a patient we were taking care of in our NICU about a month ago or so who had severe dilated cardiomyopathy secondary to Barth syndrome. It was a genetic cause. You'll notice that his LV was quite dilated and very poorly contractile. Another way you can assess for heart function is by looking at a parasternal short axis view. You're basically cutting the ventricles down the middle, looking on the barrel of the right and left ventricle. This is what a normal LV contraction should look like. And of course, you can see our baby had very poor systolic function and a dilated ventricle. So how do we go about managing babies like this? Well, I want to take a step back and ask, how do you manage any baby with hemodynamic instability? And really, the ultimate premise of what we do is to ensure that our DO2 is greater than our VO2, or make sure, in other words, that our delivery of oxygen is more than our demand of oxygen. And when this balance goes awry, we really have two options. It's not that difficult. Either decrease the body's demand for oxygen or increase the delivery. And the formula for DO2 is going to be your cardiac output times the oxygen content of arterial blood. If we break it down into its components, that's going to be your heart rate and stroke volume multiplied by the formula for your oxygen content of arterial blood. And so if you take a look at it, there are five variables there that at the bedside we can modulate to improve DO2 for the patient. Now, if we look here, hemoglobin is a very important uh, variable in this because you multiply it by a factor. So you got positive number, a whole number times a whole number, it becomes very important. On the flip side, your PO2 is multiplied by a very small fraction. So that essentially becomes irrelevant. So really what we're talking about is four variables at the bedside to improve your DO2 to VO2 relationship. But the title of this talk is cardiovascular management. And so with regards to cardiomyopathies, really the one variable we're gonna talk about for the rest of today is how do we modulate stroke volume in these patients? And let's go all the way back to the basics. Here's a pressure volume loop of the left ventricle. I think most of us are familiar with this. And so if we ask how do we modulate stroke volume, well, we can augment preload. Preload is what happens when the uh, mitral valve opens, you get diastolic filling up until the mitral valve closings. That entire process is the preload of the left ventricle. The uh, most important part of this is point B here where the mitral valve closes, aortic valve has not yet opened. And this is our left ventricular end diastolic volume or our left ventricular end diastolic pressure. I'm going to make reference to that variable quite a bit. Then in the cardiac cycle, you get a period of isovolemic contraction until uh, you open that aortic valve. And this is, we can also augment afterload, afterload being wall stress. That is the amount of stress placed on the left ventricle to open the aortic valve and eject blood throughout all of systole. And last thing we can do to modulate stroke volume is, of course, contractility. That's the uh, slope of the end systolic pressure volume relationship. So let's go through each of these one at a time. <clears throat> with regards to preload, I think all of us are pretty familiar with when we take a look at a myocyte, the way myocyte contractility works is your actin and myosin need to interact with one another. And if all your actin and myosin are lined up, you'll find yourself at the optimal side of the length tension relationship, also known as the Frank Starling curve. This is where you're able to produce maximum systolic force. The problem with dilated cardiomyopathy or any ventricle that's dilated is that now you get significant stretch of the myocyte. So now your actin and myosin are not fully aligned. The consequence is that you now find yourself on the far right end of the length tension relationship and you're not able to generate very much systolic force. And so we talk about cardiovascular medication selection. The first thing you wanna do in these babies 
is diuretics, diuretics, diuretics. We want to do everything we can to align those actin and myosin uh, binding units. We can also augment afterload, and this is something critical that we need to do. It's been very well documented in probably every single talk on NHRC that the neonatal myocardium is afterload sensitive. We don't need to repeat that. And in fact, there was a great talk by Dr. Phil Levy um, last year highlighting this. So if you're interested, please make reference to that. So how do we reduce the afterload in these patients? Well, there's something we do almost every day in the ICU, but we don't actually fully appreciate uh, the hemodynamic impact it has, and that's just intubating a baby. So let's take a look at the heart-lung interactions of intubating a baby and how that improves afterload. We know that atmospheric pressure is 760 millimeters of mercury. All of us who are breathing here are patients who are on room air. Uh, their pleural pressure is 755 or a negative five millimeters of mercury compared to atmospheric pressure, hence the term negative pressure ventilation. This negative pressure puts an outward distending force on the left ventricle. And so when the left ventricle wants to contract, it needs to overcome that outward descending force before it contracts. And so if we uh, measure how much LV force is necessary, there's a formula here that your systolic, the LV force needed is your systolic blood pressure minus your pleural pressure. And again, this is assumed structurally normal hearts. And so if we take a fictitious patient and say this neonate has a systolic pressure of 60, he's breathing room air, so he's got 60 minus a minus five, his left ventricle needs to generate 65 millimeters of mercury in order to produce a systolic blood pressure of 60. Now, let's say we intubate the patient. We've now changed the pleural pressure, assuming standard ventilator settings, to a 765. So the pleural pressure is now plus five in relation to atmospheric pressure, hence the term positive pressure ventilation. This now puts a constrictive force on the left ventricle. And if we go back to our fictitious patient, you got 60 minus a positive five. Your left ventricle now only needs to generate 55 millimeters of mercury, not 65 millimeters of mercury to produce the same systolic force. So just by virtue of changing him from negative to positive pressure ventilation, we are aiding that left ventricle. We're essentially reducing the afterload. And if you wanna use sort of a weightlifting analogy, we're not necessarily lifting weights for this left heart, but we're acting like a spotter and making the work that it needs to do a little bit easier. But we can also be more direct in augmenting our afterload. If we go back to the pressure volume loop, I said this is the point at which the amount of there's a certain amount of wall stress needed within the left ventricle to open the aortic valve. Well, what we can do is we can just reduce that afterload, reduce how much force is necessary to open the aortic valve. And if we keep with this weightlifting analogy, we're just going to reduce the weights that this left ventricle needs to bench press, so to speak. And one of the easiest ways to do it is just systemic vasodilators. In the setting of a normal heart, your SVR, your systemic vascular resistance, is going to be the primary determinant of the afterload on that left ventricle. <clears throat> so we can give hydralazine, or my personal favorite is in this patient population to use nitroprusside. Nitroprusside is a drip, easily titratable, fast on, fast off. You can titrate it to exactly what you need for that patient. Now, nothing is for free. You can't keep nitroprusside on forever. After three, four, five days, there is toxicities to it, but you can use this as a bridge to something more chronic in your, in your management. Of course, we want to use inodilators, and I'll get to that in a moment. Drugs we absolutely want to avoid are anything that's a vasoconstrictor that's going to increase the afterload on this patient. We also want to avoid anything that's got negative inotropic effects. Again, these babies don't have great systolic function. So beta blockers and calcium channel blockers are a poor choice in the acute setting. In the chronic setting, there may be a role, but not in the acute phase of management of these babies. <clears throat> Oops, there we go. So ultimately, let's get to how do we augment contractility? And before we talk about this, let's do a quick review of some of the inotropes that we have at our, at our disposal. This is the majority of uh, vasoactive medications we have, and they act on the adrenergic receptor system. We have our alpha ones on our blood vessels, and we have our beta ones on the heart. Norepinephrine and phenylephrine tend to be vasopressors. Dobutamine and aspartaminol tend to be more inotropes. And drugs like epi, for simplicity's sake, let's just say that it does equal alpha and equal beta. I know that's not always true, but for simplicity's sake, let's just say it's right down the middle. So if we have a patient in the NICU, it should be really easy to manage these uh, vasoactive medications, right? Well, not necessarily, because the problem is, is that as these babies mature and as they're, pre as they're premature, they don't have uh, full receptor maturation. So you can give as much drug as you want. If they don't have the receptors for it, your drug is not going to have full effect. 
we know that your parasympathetic nervous system matures at a more accelerated rate than your sympathetic nervous system. This is why when you're caring for an ELBW baby, they're fraught with Brady's and DSAT episodes, but you never see tacky and hypersat episodes because they're parasympathetic dominant. But let's look at the sympathetic nervous system. The alpha and beta receptors also mature at a different rate. Your alpha being more, uh, more quick than your beta ones. So whenever we talk about a baby with poor systolic function, there's one drug that is very controversial. Some people love it. Some people hate it. It's dopamine. Now, uh, I think that there are rare circumstances in which you can use dopamine. I've never used it in my career, but I can uh, I can imagine a few scenarios in which you can, but uh, some people love it. So let's just go ahead and tackle this head on and find out what exactly is the role of dopamine in somebody like with dilated cardiomyopathy. Now, I remember from Dr. Istvan Siri and Shahab Nouri's papers, uh, reading them when I was a fellow, that Dopamine has a dose-dependent response system. Oops, has a dose-dependent response system. Low to medium-dose dopamine tends to have more alpha effects, and high-dose dopamine tends to have more beta effects. And this inherently makes sense. The way dopamine exerts its effect is that it gets converted into norepinephrine. Norepinephrine is predominantly alpha, so that makes a lot of sense. Another reason that makes sense is you just have more alpha adrenergic receptors than you do beta, so it's just easier to stimulate those vessels, so it tends to be more of a vasopressor than an inotrope. However, if you go and take a look at pediatric literature, they'll tell you the opposite. They'll tell you that low to medium dose dopamine has more of a beta effect, and high dose dopamine is what's necessary to have any alpha effect. But like I said, this talk, we're not going to focus on pediatric patients, so let's just continue on. The lion's share of babies that we're going to take care of in the NICU with dilated cardiomyopathy are either going to be term, near term, or early infants. So what dose of dopamine should we use in these patients? Well, unfortunately, nobody really knows because there's no way to objectively measure receptor maturation. So we don't really know what the response is. Now, we can titrate any drug to get any blood pressure that we desire, but are we actually improving contractility and our DO2 to VO2 relationship? It gets much harder to, uh, to, to decipher that. Now, I gave a talk at the Pediatric Cardiac Intensive Care Society meeting, I don't know, seven, eight years ago when I was in a pro-con debate with Dr. Martina Stewart. Those of you that don't know her, she's out at UCSF, she's excellent. And the title of this pro-con debate was, is dopamine the drug of the devil? And I was tasked with defending the drug. And she was tasked with arguing that, no, it is the devil. And as she was uh, giving her talk, she's like, of course it's the drug of the devil. Look at it. It actually even has a, it, uh, the molecular structure looks satanic. And as she did this, I was just laughing and I thought this was really funny and really clever. And those of you that know Martina, she's a really witty person. So this just sort of stuck in my brain. And the reason I tell you this story is now fast forward a few years, we're in the depths of the pandemic at Chalk, uh, where I work. And we had this baby with uh, dilated cardiomyopathy, very sick, and we're doing everything we can to keep this kid off of ECMO. And we had a travel nurse at the time and she was she was nothing short of excellent. And so we're doing all sorts of things and nothing is working. And she comes to me and she says, hey, Dr. Shrafi, do you think we should try dopamine on this baby? And I said, no, you know, dopamine is not a great choice. And I give her all the reasons why I don't, I don't particularly like dopamine in this scenario. A few hours go by, baby's still not getting better. And she keeps on asking me multiple times about dopamine. I'm wondering why she's perseverating on dopamine. Well, as I walk out of the room, she goes to put her hair in a ponytail and I notice the back of her neck and I go, wait a minute. Is that a dopamine molecule tattooed on your neck? And she gets really excited. She's like, oh my God, Dr. Shrapi, yes. Nobody knows what this is. How did you know? Now, I didn't want to tell her that in my mind, this is a satanic, uh, molecular, uh, satanic molecule. So I had to lie to her. I told her I was a chemistry major in college. And I remember on a midterm, I there was this molecule there. So none of that was true. But, uh, but I just... So, so at the time, I then said, you know, this is the coolest thing ever. I, her passion for hemodynamics is clearly second to none. I asked her, I said, is it okay if I take a picture of your tattoo? I don't know when and I don't know where, but this can end up great on a PowerPoint one day. And she was like, yeah, of course. So I took her picture. Um, I just thought that was a great story. Again, I didn't tell her that I thought it was satanic in nature. However, I do want to exert a challenge here. Uh, my good friend, Dr. Patrick McNamara, uh, if you really are as passionate about hemodynamics as you say you are, I think you should also get a topamine uh, tattoo on your neck. I think it would I think it would suit you perfectly. But let's keep going. 
So we know that we don't want any alpha agonist drugs when managing these babies with dilated cardiomyopathy. So really you wanna focus on pure beta adrenergic drugs. These will improve contractility and because of their beta-2 crossover, we'll have smooth muscle relaxation. They will vasodilate the vasculature. These are what we refer to as inodilators. And of course, we can always give steroids to upregulate the beta receptors to make these drugs more effective. Now, the problem with these inodilators that are adrenergic agonists is that in addition to inotropy, they also have chronotropic effects. So it makes the patient more tachycardic. It increases your myocardial VO2. And as we talked about, their VO2 to DO2 relationship is quite, quite tenuous to begin with. So really the drug of choice to optimize contractility in this patient population is going to be milrinone. It's an inodilator has no chronotropic, no chronotropic effects and does not increase myocardial VO2. Now there's one other drug that claims to have the same profile and that's levosimendin, but unfortunately, calcium channel sensitizer. Now, unfortunately we don't have levosimendin in the US, so I don't have any experience with this, but I know that uh, Shovik uh, has this in Canada. So I'll be interested to hear if he has any experience with, with that drug. <clears throat> so if we do a quickly review in dilated cardiomyopathy, if we look at the triad of preload, afterload, and contractility, we want to diurese, diurese, diurese as much as we can, reduce afterload, and optimize contractility with inodilators, primarily milrinone. Now, with that being said, let's move to the next one, restrictive cardiomyopathy. Now, this is the most difficult one, for uh, most difficult series of slides for me to make, and it's also difficult to present because this is something that we just don't understand particularly well. And if you look at epidemiology, uh, it'll have you believe that restrictive cardiomyopathy is amongst the rarest of cardiomyopathies in neonates. However, I'm going to push back on that. And I'm going to say, I don't necessarily think that's true. I think it is just rarely diagnosed. And I'm going to try to convince all of you that in my opinion, this is the most common type of cardiomyopathy that we see in neonates. The problem is we just don't know it when we see it. The hallmark of restrictive cardiomyopathies is that you have normal ventricular uh, morphology, normal thickness, normal ventricular size, and normal systolic ejection fraction. The problem with these babies is they have abnormal ventricular relaxation, or in other words, they have severe diastolic dysfunction. If we go back to our pressure volume loop, they have a significant increase in their LVEDP, or their left ventricular and diastolic pressure, while they maintain normal systolic function. Again, the slope of their end systolic pressure volume relationship does not change. The consequence of this elevated LVEDP is they get reduced stroke volume. As you can imagine, if you're a red blood cell sitting in the left atrium and your choice is to either go down to the mitral valve and into the left ventricle where your LVEDP is 15 or go across the PFO to where your right atrial pressure is five, of course, you're gonna go down the path of least resistance. You're gonna shunt left to right and you're gonna have reduced stroke volume out of that left ventricle. The best talk I heard on diastolic dysfunction was by Dr. Kurt Duwall uh, here in the NHRC channel back in 2021. So if anybody's interested, please uh, take a look at that phenomenal talk. So if we go to etiologies, well, one of the etiologies is extreme prematurity. And this is one of those ones where the more we look, the more we find. There are dozens, there's just a few papers in PubMed that I have here that talk about how these neonates have impaired relaxation or they have stiff left ventricles. And there are multiple reasons for that. But the primary reason, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but um, when you're extremely preterm, you have fewer myocytes and you have more collagen. We know that collagen is stiffer than myocytes. In addition, all of us have some degree of collagen in our hearts. We have predominantly a type one collagen. These babies are preterm have predominantly a type three collagen, type three being the stiff of, stiffest of all the collagen types. So they become, uh, they naturally have impaired relaxation. They become very preload resistance. But the question we have to ask ourselves, and this is where I sort of struggle to wrap my head around it. When is this normal physiologic immaturity associated with prematurity? And when is it abnormal pathology? When can we go ahead and call this a cardiomyopathy? Well, there was a patient we were taking care of a few months ago, uh, extremely preterm, clearly had ground glass appearance on his chest x-ray, gave multiple doses of surfactant, lungs cleared up. Uh, fast forward a couple of days, we get a call that baby's lungs now look like this. I thought almost certainly he was going to have a PDA. They asked us to get an echo on the baby. And when we got the echo, there was no PDA actually. But what I did notice is he had a very large left atrium. 
And when we measured his LV mechanics, he had a very stiff, non-compliant left ventricle. So it made it difficult for blood to exit left atrium down through the mitral valve. Now, this isn't something we normally see because our babies frequently have a pop-off to their left atrium. They have a PFO, so blood can shunt left to right. Now, it will increase your QPQS, but it doesn't lead to left atrial dilation. Interestingly enough, this baby had a restrictive atrial communication. And so when blood came in, there was no source of egress. It couldn't go down the mitral valve, couldn't go, go across the PFO, and it started to back up, back up, back up. And about an hour or two later, this baby developed a severe pulmonary hemorrhage. Now, I don't have any randomized controlled trials uh, to tell you what I'm about to tell you, but I can tell you anecdotally at our center, 100% of babies who develop pulmonary hemorrhage had evidence of a stiff left ventricle associated with prematurity and a restrictive atrial septum. So in this scenario, do I think it was normal physiologic immaturity or pathologic restrictive cardiomyopathy? I lean more towards the latter. Now, if we go beyond the acute and go into the more chronic phase of things, there's more and more evidence that patients who do have this physiologic subtype are at higher risk of bronchopulmonary dysplasia. Earlier in the year, Dr. Uh, Arvind Segal gave a great talk on this. And in fact, let me give a shout out to my, uh, my current fourth year fellow and soon to be partner, Dr. J.D. Hammond. He's been wondering about this quite a bit. I know he's thinking about doing this study. I don't know if he's at intellectually pulled the trigger or not, but if anybody is interested in doing a multi-center collaboration, please feel free to reach out to him. This is an interest of his. It's not just extreme prematurity. Severe lung hypoplasia and diaphragmatic hernia can also have a restrictive cardiomyopathy-like pattern. This was a talk I gave last year um, asking, uh, looking specifically at CDH. I don't want to spend too much time on this. If anybody's interested, you can go back and look at the video. But whenever you've got any of these lung hypoplasias, you get more right to left shunting through the duct throughout gestational maturation, which means you get less venous return and you get less volume loading of that left ventricle. And specifically in right-sided diaphragmatic hernia, as that liver comes up into the chest, it changes the three-dimensional geometry of the ductus spinosus. So now it's angled toward the tricuspid valve, not towards the PFO. Again, the consequence is nine months of reduced volume loading to that left heart. We know from hypoplastic left heart data that the way you grow a left ventricle is through a volume load, not through a pressure load. We've also known since the mid 80s that these babies with severe diaphragmatic hernia have smaller, stiffer left ventricles. And there's a growing body of literature over the last several years that the babies who are at highest risk of needing ECMO associated with CDH have significant diastolic impairment. So is there a restrictive cardiomyopathy here? Again, we think so. There's just not a lot of data out there. Here's another one, Inter uh, severe intrauterine growth restriction. The more we look, the more we find. These are just a few papers on PubMed, but there's a whole lot more. Is this just a feature of growth restriction or is this more than that? And is it a restrictive cardiomyopathy? Here is a patient we took care of just about six months ago, 34 weeker, significant growth restricted. If you take a look at his echo, his left ventricle is normal size, looks really snappy, great systolic function. And we Dopplered his mitral inflow. Those of you who aren't familiar, um, if you take a look at mitral inflow, it happens in a biphasic manner. You have your E wave and your A wave. Now here, the, va the waves are a little bit fused, but if you take a look in a normal pediatric or adult patient, most of the left ventricular filling happens during this E wave or early diastole. The mitral valve opens. The left ventricle is so compliant that it acts like a vacuum. It just dilates and sucks blood in from the left atrium into the left ventricle until the pressure starts to equilibrate. Then you get your atrial kick or your A wave, which sort of tops off the filling of the left ventricle. Now, this is normal in pediatric and adult patients. In neonates, because of, as I told you, their myocardial composition is different, they all have impaired relaxation or they all have an element of stiffness. So their E waves are always smaller or usually smaller. And a ventricular filling is dependent on your atrial contractility. So your E wave is smaller than your A wave, which is what we see here. About 24 to 48 hours later, we did another echo. Now you start to see better separation of his E and A waves. And now they're about the same magnitude, very normal in neonatology, very abnormal in other patient populations. But again, we didn't think much of it. Another 24 to 48 hours later, we get a call saying baby is acutely ill. Chest x-ray is distinctly worse. Baby's starting to develop lactic acidosis. We get an echo, and now we see 
this, the left ventricle still looks largely the same, same size, good systolic function, but notice how much bigger that left atrium is. And can I convince you that now you've got your atrial septum bowing from left to right? When we did a Doppler interrogation of his mitral valve, he now has complete reversal of his E and A wave, E being more dominant than A. If there was not much diligence here, you would say, oh, this baby's heart is more mature than I would expect. This is what is supposed to be no big deal. But that would be wrong because there's also a phenomenon known as pseudonormalization. In severe diastolic dysfunction, this left atrium is under such high pressure that once that mitral valve opens, you get a rush of blood that goes in from LA to LV. It's not that the LV is compliant and relaxed and swallowing that blood up, but it's just that the LA is under such high pressure that as soon as there's any chance of egress, it's going to take it. Uh, so we noticed this. We then went ahead and Dopplered his uh, left and right pulmonary veins, and blood flow in the pulmonary veins should only go in one direction. It should go from veins to atrium. But interestingly enough, every time his atria would contract, you would have reversal of flow. Blood was going backwards because there was just so much LA hypertension. This is clearly abnormal, and I would classify this not so much as an abnormal, uh, uh, normal physiology, but a definite restrictive cardiomyopathy. And diligence is key because if you were just zipping along and not paying attention, the baby's heart function looked absolutely perfect. This is actually textbook normal systolic function, but with restrictive cardiomyopathy, it's not systolic disease, it's diastolic disease. And unless we're looking for it, we don't see it. In the interest of time, I'm gonna skip over TDIs. I'm gonna skip over um, E prime measurements and uh, E to E to E prime can be a surrogate for LV EDP and adults with restrictive cardiomyopathy, never been validated in neonates. We don't need to spend much time there. I do want to quickly say there's a whole other group of patients, those with sepsis um, who have been, uh, who actually, let me back up. This whole group of patients, we don't actually know how to classify them. We don't know. And I don't really know, is this just transient diastolic dysfunction, transient impaired relaxation, or can we elevate it to the category of a restrictive cardiomyopathy? Babies with severe sepsis, it's been shown over and over again in older patients that those who sepsis is so severe who develop diastolic dysfunction have a significantly higher mortality rate than those who don't. We know recipients of twin-twin transfusion have very stiff non-compliant left ventricles. And there's this growing body of literature after you close the ductus arteriosus, their left ventricles become quite stiff. But again, how do we classify this as a group of neonatal uh, cardiac intensive care and hemodynamic providers? We've never really come to a consensus on this. Now, if this is a topic that's of interest to you, Dr. Adrian Bischoff gave a talk on this earlier in the year on the both systolic, but also diastolic impact of ductal closure. So if anyone's interested, uh, please take a look at that video. And so if we now skip over and ask, what is the best cardiovascular medication to select in these patients? I'm gonna take a little bit of liberty and say the best thing you can do doesn't really pertain to preload, afterload, and contractility necessarily. The most important thing is diligence and curiosity. There is so much patient-to-patient -patient variability. There is so much hour-to-hour -hour variability within each patient that it requires diligence, requires curiosity, and is a very delicate balancing act. This is just the best I can tell you in 2024 because we just don't have a lot of information on this, uh, this physiologic subtype. Now, let's actually not, uh, not take the easy way out and try to answer these questions. With regards to preload, there's going to be times you want to give volume and times you want to diurese. You can imagine that dehydration and tachycardia is going to be the worst thing for these babies. Their problem is inability to fill the left ventricle in diastole. So the worst thing you can do is limit your time in diastole. You want to avoid tachycardia. Give volume if there's any concerns for dehydration. We also know that blood travels downstream. And so if you've got elevated uh, LV or RV EDP and diastolic pressure, you're going to need a higher atrial filling pressures in order for blood to go downstream. And the best way to do that is with supplemental volume. But on the flip side, these babies have congested appearances. They've got congested lungs. They have congested livers down to the pelvis. It's hard to give a baby like that more and more volume, in which case diuretics might be the right answer. So really it is a tiptoe. You're trying to walk that fine line. With regards to afterload, we want to reduce the amount of afterload or, again, in structurally normal hearts, essentially reduce SVR that these patients are seeing. Now, 
this isn't entirely intuitive. So why would you want to reduce your SVR in a baby with diastolic dysfunction? If we go back to our pressure volume loops and I said SVR or afterload is the wall stress placed on the left ventricle in order to open the aortic valve. Well, what we want to do in this scenario, it's not systolic dysfunction, it's diastolic dysfunction. So imagine if we reduce our afterload, make it easier for that aortic valve to open if that's the case, it now becomes easier to empty the aortic valve. And the best way to improve filling of the LV with a restrictive physiology is to ensure that it is maximally empty at the end of systole. So that's why we want to reduce afterload. It doesn't have any direct effects on diastolic function, but it can definitely impair diastolic function. Again, everything is a balancing act. Um, you always get a little bit anxious, at least I do, uh, when you have a baby who's got poor stroke volume, who's got questionable end organ perfusion, and now you want to drop their afterload, again, that's a very delicate balance um, to maintain. <clears throat> With regards to contractility, contractility is preserved, not really an issue in these patients. I do want to touch on milrinone, though, for just a few moments. Everybody has uh, touted the lucitropic properties of milrinone. I've done it as well. And even though I frequently say milrona is known to be a good lucitropic drug, I don't know if that's true. And I don't know if I necessarily, not that I don't know, I actually started to change my mind on this. And I'm starting to think that that is not a true statement. And there's several reasons for this. I have never been able to find a study that milrinone improves relaxation or has lucitropic properties in the neonatal myocardium. Now, if there's anybody who is aware and you want to forward me a paper and I'm in the chat line, I would love to be educated. I've never seen that paper. But if we look at adult and in vitro studies, the way milrinone in, exerts its lucitropic effects, we know it's a uh, phosphodiesterase inhibitor, which increases cyclic AMP, increases activation of protein kinase A, which leads to a reuptake of calcium by your sarcoplasmic reticulum. As you eliminate calcium, your actin and myosin detach from one another and you relax that myocyte. Now that's great and all, but we talked earlier that the reason the neonatal myocardium is stiff it's not because of slow reuptake of calcium. It's because they have fewer cardiac myocytes to the amount of collagen. No amount of milrinone is going to change that ratio. Number two, we also highlighted that they are deficient in type one, but uh, have a lot of type three. Again, no amount of milrinone is going to change the collagen composition. So I hesitate to think that milrinone has lucitropic effects. In addition, and for the third reason, we also know that neonatal myocytes are deficient in intracellular calcium. We know they have a rudimentary sarcoplasmic reticulum. So I just have a hard time wrapping my mind around how milrinone is going to improve calcium reuptake and relaxation. Again, I'm not, I'm not against it. I just haven't quite wrapped my head around it. And the reason um, I highlight this is because I really want to make a shout out and a pitch. If there's any ambitious, talented people out there that you want to leave your mark on neonatal cardiovascular intensive care and hemodynamics, this is an area of restricted cardiomyopathy and therapies in it that is wide open and untouched. So please come in here and uh, teach us how we can be better. <clears throat> now, um, in the last about five minutes or so that I have, I'm going to quickly go through hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. This is one that I think everybody knows quite well. So I, I, I don't want to spend too much time here. This is frequently what we see in infant and diabetic mothers, chronic steroid use, you get hypertrophy to ventricular walls, reduction in chamber volume, ultimately leading to diastolic dysfunction and restrictive atrial filling. I don't want to spend too much time on the diagnostic algorithm, but let's look at the echo of these babies. Here is a parasternal long axis view. Essentially what you're doing is you're just taking the heart and you're flipping it onto its side. So you have your left atrium, mitral valve into your left ventricle. You get your left ventricular outflow track and into your uh, aorta. Here's a baby we were taking care of about a year ago. Notice how much thicker that ventricular septum is. And I also want you to uh, take note that it is so thick, it is now encroaching on your left ventricular outflow tract, obstructing systemic blood flow. Here's that same patient in parasitic short axis. You'll notice again, these babies do not have systolic dysfunction. If anything, they have hyperdynamic left ventricles with ejection fractions of 70, 80, 90%. Their problem is an inability to relax and fill during diastole. Um, if we take a look at the apical four chamber view and we put Doppler on it, you'll notice that there starts to be flow acceleration just before it gets the aortic valve. And we measure this, you see this classic sawtooth appearance. Once you see this sawtooth appearance, you know that there is active obstruction 
to blood flow during systole. So let's look at, again, our triad of preload, afterload, contractility in the management of these patients and ask, what is the best cardiovascular medication? Volume, volume, volume. That is the best cardiovascular medication in these patients for several reasons. Number one, it's going to stabilize your circulation. We know that a dehydrated left ventricle is going to collapse and that thick septum is going to encroach on your left ventricular outflow tract. So making sure that it's hydrated will stretch everything out and improve uh, LV output. In addition, if you are dehydrated, that's going to cause tachycardia. And you can imagine that at baseline, these thick hearts have a higher myocardial oxygen demand. And if you become tachycardic, you're only exacerbating its VO2 needs, which we know can be quite problematic. In addition, the, the more tachycardic you are, the less feeling you have in diastole, the less coronary feeling you have. So this becomes quite problematic and um, will lead to a severe imbalance between your VO2 and your DO2 relationships. So volume, volume, volume. This is the one patient in which afterload is now your friend. We've been talking about how afterload sensitive these patients are, and we want to reduce our afterload. This is the uh, opposite to that. Coronary perfusion pressure is your diastolic blood pressure minus your LVEDP, left ventricular end diastolic pressure. And as we know, these babies have very, very high left ventricular end diastolic pressure. So the number one thing to, the first thing to be affected is gonna be your coronary perfusion. We just highlighted how that can be quite problematic. So the way to ensure reliable coronary perfusion, <clears throat> excuse me, is to drive up that SVR and increase your diastolic blood pressure as much as you safely can. You absolutely wanna avoid any beta agonist drugs here, dopamine, epi, even norepi, which is predominantly alpha, but does have some beta. These are all going to be the drugs of the devil when it comes to this patient population. So how do you increase your diastolic blood pressure or your SVR? You want your pure alpha-1 agonist drugs like your phenylephrine or your pure V1 agonist drugs like vasopressin. With regards to contractility, these babies are hypercontractile, so you want negative inotropic drugs. This is where your beta blockers are going to come in, and beta blockers will be key. It's going to reduce myocardial oxygen demand. It's going to improve uh, diastolic filling. It's going to improve your LV outflow tract. In older patients, they have used calcium channel blockers with some success. I've never seen in the NICU, but I guess theoretically it's possible. And in the worst case scenario, you may need PGE to maintain adequate systemic perfusion. Now, the one thing to keep in mind is that probably your best drug uh, after volume and beta blockers is gonna be time. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in neonates tends to be a self-limiting condition. This isn't necessarily true for pediatric and adults, but in our patients, if you can buy yourself time, that LV will start to relax, you will get muscular atrophy and your symptoms will improve. Now, here's my last slide. And I threw this in there because this was just such an interesting case for me. Usually when we think of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, we always think of left heart disease. Here was a baby that had hypertrophic cardiomyopathy of the right heart. This was a mom who had chronic back pain from a motor vehicle accident previously. She becomes pregnant and her OB says, you know what? Ibuprofen is bad because it can close the duct for the fetus. You need to take Tylenol. So mom starts taking a lot of Tylenol. Baby comes out and is immediately significantly desaturated and resistant to anything we do. So about 30 to 40 minutes of life, we do an echo and we find that this baby has no ductus arteriosus and a significantly hypertrophied right ventricle. And now it makes sense why the baby's so desaturated. It's not a lung problem. This is a perfusion problem. You can imagine if you're a red blood cell sitting in the right atrium and your choice is to go down to the right ventricle with an RV EDP of 20 or go across the PFO with a left atrial pressure of five, of course you're going to shunt right to left. And that's why this baby is desaturated. No amount of oxygen or nitric oxide is going to improve the relaxation of this thick RV. So when it comes to management strategies, of course, we volume, volume, volume. Of course, we did beta blockers. We tried PGE unsuccessfully, did not open the ductus. But really, the biggest thing we did here was redefine success. We didn't necessarily need this baby to have saturations of 95% and higher. We knew, based on our formula for DO2 and making sure that our DO2 to VO2 relationship is okay, if we keep our hemoglobin high, 13, 14, 15, this baby's going to do just fine with oxygen saturation of 75%. And lo and behold, that's exactly what happened. After about two weeks or so, baby's RV started to relax. It developed better uh, pulmonary blood flow, and ultimately, baby went home and did just fine. 
in the interest of time and to maximize conversation, I'm going to just skip over the conclusions real quick. I just want to highlight real quickly. Uh, thank you for the kind words, Strobik, on uh, NeoHeart. Uh, you're a staple in this meeting. You're there every year. Uh, we're going to be doing it in New York this year. It's going to be led by um, the team at Columbia University. Dr. Ganga Krishnamurthy is going to be the physician champion. The program looks absolutely spectacular. And with her partners in crime, Dr. Nim Goldstrom and Diana Vargas, there's no doubt this is going to be amazing. And then next year, we're going to bring it back down to Southern California and San Diego. So hope to see you guys at one or both of these meetings. And I also want to give a quick shout out we're about to open our application portal if anybody's interested in a fourth year fellowship in neonatal cardiovascular intensive care and hemodynamics at CHOC July 2025 incoming class. So with that being said, I thank you all for your time and I turn it over to the moderators. Hi, thank you so much, Amir, for such wonderful talk. Um, this is very comprehensive and I, I think we all learn a lot from your talk today. I have uh, questions for you though. Um, we do know that we use a lot of advanced um, echo or TN echo in terms of helping manage um, these patients with cardiomyopathy. Um, what are other um, monitoring modality or other clinical findings that could help um, in terms of management of the patient in clinical settings where um, the neonatologist might not have as readily available um, advanced echocardiography, as in like some of the institutions that do have neonatal hemodynamics present? No, excellent question. And actually I can give my two cents on this. I'll be interested to hear if anybody on the panel agrees or disagrees. Um, I don't necessarily think it's the ability to perform an echo. And again, uh, I'd be interested to hear if you guys agree or disagree. It's not the ability to perform the echo, it's the brain attached to the echo. Do you understand what the information is giving you. So do I need to go and get the image or does JD Hammond, my fellow need to get the images? No, but what we do need the ability to do is to have a face-to-face -face conversation either with each other or face-to-face -face conversation with our cardiologist and say, help me understand what exactly is happening at the level of the right ventricle. What is happening at the left ventricle? Tell me about systolic performance. Tell me about feeling. Is volume gonna work? Is volume not gonna work? Um, cardiology oftentimes, you know, wants to do one echo a day and they sort of hesitate to do two, three echoes a day, but it's okay to pick up a phone and say, Hey, we just started a new medication. I don't want to know about your tricuspid valve Z scores. I don't want to know about coronary artery Z scores. I want to know, did my ejection fraction improve once I went up on epinephrine and started steroids? And it's that ability to have the direct conversation. Again, it's the brain attached to the probe, not the person holding the probe, if that makes sense. Does that answer the question? Yes, and yeah. and I and I can ask like the rest of the um, panelists here too that um, I think it's more important for us to know what questions to ask cardiologists to get the information that we need in terms of managing the patient. Um, I completely agree with with everything that both of you said too. Um, you know, it's that conversation of like dissecting out, you know, what is all reported in that echo, but actually looking at the echo even together um, to look at those parameters that you're actually interested in and can intervene upon and how your medication has changed what you saw from previous to now. Um, it's, um, you know, I, I don't know how you all have in your institutions, but for, for us, we definitely, um, you know, bring in the cardiologists to have those discussions. They come in the rounds with us now so that we can have those in-depth conversations and go through the echoes together so that we are all on the same page about the game plan and why we chose this and that. And if this medication doesn't work, then we will go on to the next medication based on what we're seeing on the echo. Thanks, Jenny. Uh, again, Amir, wonderful, wonderful talk. Learned so much today. Um, and I would like to bring bring in the panel here. And I see in the chat, in the uh, like Q&A, a lot of uh, enthusiasm and interest around the different aspects that you touched upon. So I'll just kind of go one by one and bring in the panelists. So there's one question on the, the issue of restrictive cardiomyopathy, especially in the context of an extremely preterm infant, BPD, pulmonary hypertension. Some babies have associated systemic hypertension, some do not. So maybe I can I can bring in Danielle here and have your thoughts on 
is there differences in approach to management when there is associated systemic hypertension versus not? And again, it brings us back to that conversation of bringing in different specialties together. Yeah, so um, we do a comprehensive evaluation um, uh, for all of our uh, babies when we're doing our hemodynamics consult. So um, we look at blood pressure parameters. We look at everything. Um, you know, we have about 80 to 100 images on all of our echoes. And so, uh, you know, when we see diastolic dysfunction, we do try to correlate it with um, high blood pressure or any other reason why the baby might be having diastolic dysfunction. Um, but if there is not high blood pressure, if there is not documented hypertension, we don't actually treat high blood pressure, if that makes sense. So um, LV diastolic dysfunction in a BPD baby with high blood pressure, we would start probably enalapril if they're greater than 36 weeks. Um, but somebody who does not have problems with blood pressure, we would not start the enalapril. Great. Curious to know uh, from the other panelists, any differences in practice in their own institutions with this? Because this is fairly common that at least in our institution, we we stumble upon a lot and we always scratch our heads what to do with this blood pressure that is not high enough to bug the nephrologist, but is just high enough uh, when I put that in the context of, a, of some diastolic dysfunction. I think it's also difficult because we don't have a great um, on what high blood pressure is. And I believe that a lot of different institutions will use different um, parameters as well. And so when you're looking at the individual patient, like there are some patients who had a baseline blood pressure and now it is higher. So we would consider those potentially hyper, hypertension, right? But somebody who's still at their same baseline uh, is the ones that we would not consider that for. Wonderful. Any, any other thoughts from any other panelists before we move on to the next question? Yeah, I would just echo that uncertainty about the the normal quote normal range of blood pressures in our surviving preterm babies, plus the inaccuracy of cuff blood pressures. They're plus or minus twenty or thirty. Remember, the blood pressure that you see in the chart is the sixth one that the nurse took after they tried getting the baby back to sleep and everything else. Uh, if everybody hasn't seen it already, have a look at the Bopley technology that's emerging as a continuous non-invasive blood pressure. Uh, reading that that hopefully will be a significant improvement on on cuffs. My personal nihilism to hypertension, systemic hypertension in ex premies is to almost always ignore it un until we feel like we can't ignore it anymore. And yes, at that point we we start an ACE inhibitor. Wonderful. So Alan, while uh, while we have you, uh, there was a question on on uh, maturational differences in Titan activity in the context of of the physiology of cardiomyopathy. So I was hoping to have your your thoughts on that. Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping I can share my screen. I don't know if that's coming up for you now or not. Yes, yes, it is. Uh, one of the things I, I enjoyed most about Amir's talk, and I enjoyed many things, was his uh, willingness to disrupt the current status quo mm -hmm. and understanding of what we think is happening. And I'm going to do the same about the Frank Starling curve, because I, I have a feeling that we were just taught it wrong in medical and nursing school, and that this notion that it that it's due to the overlapping points of actin and myosin is just total bunkum. Why do I think it's total bunkum? Well, I think it's bunkum because we were always taught that this additional cardiac contractility that came with more stretch happened without the need for any additional energy. But if it's due to actin myosin overlap, it should require more ATP and more energy. And I've it's never sat well with me and for the last 20 or 30 years, we've known about this molecule called Titan. And there's going to be a number of people on this call who've never heard of Titan. I think that's a shame. I think it speaks to our being behind with our physiology teaching. Titan is the largest protein molecule in the body. It's a molecular spring. And it joins the end of your actin and myosin molecules in each of your sarcomeres. And there's a few really relevant things about Titan for the rest of this discussion. But the key is this is a molecular spring that the more your muscles are stretched, as soon as your heart starts to contract, this Titan springs back. And it's one of the key reasons why we have this increased uh, length force interaction that we do in the Frank Starling curve. 
So I've put a link to this review article in the chat. Stuff on Titan comes up in more and more of the circulatory reviews. But the question was, is Titan different between uh, at different developmental stages? And it definitely is. And it comes back, I think, to what Amir was saying about the need of the left ventricle to be stretched for it to grow. And it makes sense then that you can't have a very effective elastic molecule in your growing left ventricle, because if it was, the elastic would stretch, but the muscles wouldn't, and therefore your left ventricle wouldn't grow. So tighten in the fetus and the newborn has a much flatter curve than the than the curve that you and I have as we're sitting watching this uh, video. But there's one other thing I have to mention about Titan, and it's the it's the only thing where I would really disrupt this question about the Frank Starling curve. I have a suspicion that there is no upper limit to the Frank Starling curve. We always draw it as going up and over the top, but that's not actually what the molecular studies show. The molecular studies show that no matter how much you stretch the sarcomere, you get more and more cardiac contractility. I do, however, completely agree with Amir that we can have the heart too full. But I'm not sure that's because it, the contractility becomes impaired with more stretch. I suspect it's because the fuller you are, the more back pressure you have on the left atrium, the more back pressure you have on the more pulmonary veins, the worse your pulmonary edema. And at some point in that process, the worsening of the pulmonary edema trumps any value you're getting for more cardiac stretch and more cardiac contractility. So I totally agree that in many of these kids, the answer is diuries, 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 if the lungs are full of, if the lungs are full of fluid. But I want to challenge the conventional physiology and have people at least open to the idea that this tighten and this stretch and this molecular spring behavior is a really key part of the physiology that we haven't been spending enough time on. Wonderful. I mean, this is this is shaping up to a great discussion. Amir, any thoughts? No, this is uh, this makes a lot of sense. I never read that paper, but um, yeah, Alan is uh, there's a reason why Alan is who he is. He's always just one step ahead of everybody. That's really interesting, Alan. Great. Um, so I I see lots of questions coming up and and a lot related to preterms. I mean, no. No wonder we talk about the preterm heart as a unique cardiomyopathy in itself. Um, so um, I'll move on to the next question and maybe Jenny, this is for you. Uh, so there was a question on post PDA closure and severe hypotension following that does not respond to milrinone. What would be a, a, your treatment strategy? I was afraid you were gonna ask me this one. <laughs> Um, I can tell you, I can tell you what we do and I'm not saying that it's, um, right. I'm saying this is just sort of the convention of what we've done here, um, at CHLA. Um, first of all, I'll say, you know, we don't really do ligations so much anymore. I think that's sort of the common thread among everyone now. I don't remember the last time we did a ligation in a preemie. Um, it did come up recently though because we had a baby with a fungal back infection and was, anyway, we'll get into that. But um, anywho, so um, in terms of um, post ligation syndrome, we still think of it when we get the piccolo closures because I know that it's definitely um, less common to see the hemodynamic instability after a piccolo closure, but I think all of us have still seen it at least a little bit. Um, and so um, commonly we are still on that dreaded satanic medicine called dopamine. <laughs> um, but I think it's, you know, I think we are at CHLA one of the last to, you know, we're still, at least we're still in the dopamine um, sponsory. I was very much a dopamine um, uh, lever here. Um, and so Shahab and I still do use dopamine. Um, the unit um, is very comfortable with dopamine. A lot of the babies who come to us are, are, are on dopamine. Um, so it is kind of hard to um, change that. Um, so, so I'm just sort of putting that as a, you know, caveat and disclaimer. 
Um, but when we think about the actual physiology, what's happening um, with the post ligation syndrome, um, we, we do, uh, we're quick to start steroid. A lot of these babies are adrenally insufficient. We're not to the point that Iowa is where I think you guys have um, all your babies on hydrocortisone, I think pre, pre calf you guys can correct me on that. Um, but we're not there yet. We did, we tend to check a cortisol level and kind of know where we're at in terms of adrenal insufficiency. We might start the steroid before um, going for the closure, um, but definitely if there's instability afterward, we'll jump really quickly to starting the steroid. Um, and then if we're already on dopamine, then our, our next press are actually of choice is epinephrine. Um, but milrinone, we have not actually incorporated yet. And I was curious to see to hear about, especially with this question, you're saying with the hypotension that doesn't respond to milrinone. I wonder just operationally, how does that look for you? How you decide, you know, you have a baby who's hypotensive and then you start milrinone. Are you worried, like, how, do you see a, an initial, you know, uh, decrease in your blood pressure? How, how do you get the courage to start that? I had, that's just not in our, um, in our domain yet, so. I see Alan uh, has hand raised and I saw him clap when uh, Amir had a shout out for dopamine, which opens a can of worms. So Alan, take it away. I mean, there's so much to talk about here and we should acknowledge how much we don't know. I do want to make entirely clear that we are never conflating hypotension and circulatory failure. Those are two entirely distinct things. And I think sometimes we conflate the two together. So if one is hypotensive, but has adequate tissue perfusion by whatever metric you want to use, but let's say uh, capillary refill time, oxygenation, urine output and lactate level, I think most of us are going to say that we're not going to try to do anything post-ligation. I think that I suspect that the true post ligation syndrome is a mix of a sudden decrease in preload because all of that ductal flow was coming back to the left atrium, a sudden increase in afterload because suddenly the low PVR has disappeared, and then a degree of inflammatory driven myocardial contractility impairment from IL 6 and all those other bits and pieces that I don't understand. But no, if the child is hypotensive, I certainly personally wouldn't want to be giving any milrinone to that baby because I want to give milrinone as an afterload reducing agent. I might want to give milrinone if the child has circulatory failure and an increased lactate if their blood pressure would tolerate it. And yes, I, I, I've already written up the hydrocort as I'm walking to the bedside when I hear that that kid post PDA uh, piccolo uh, has got any kind of circulatory compromise. Danielle, your thoughts? I can just quickly say from the Iowa perspective, um, so yes, we do give steroids. We oftentimes check an ACTH stem test to decide if we you know, uh, should be concerned about weaning the steroids off quickly, but uh, we give one dose prior to the cath lab, and then we try to wean it off pretty quickly thereafter. Um, because we're we're concerned more about hypertension. So I I personally don't really know if we've had any hypotension after um, PDA ligation or, or cath closure here. Oh, Patrick is not a panelist, but does have his hand up. But um, you know, so what we see is hypertension. And so we do an echo one hour after the closure, whether it be ligation or cath closure, we also do not do many ligations here at Iowa anymore. Um, and we determine milrinone usage based on that. And we will give a normal saline bolus for one hour to try to, you know, like avoid any of the, of the blood pressure issues that might come with starting the milrinone. Um, Patrick, your thoughts? Hi, guys. This is a wonderful, wonderful discussion. I just got off the plane, so I'm I'm in Miami at the moment. Um, I couldn't I could not respond to Amir's request for a tattoo. That's the first thing I'm going to say. Uh, all I, all I will say, Amir, is if you want me to have a tattoo, it'll be put on a part of my body that I can't say on the stage here. So, so be it. <laughs> I, I do have a question though, and actually um, uh, it goes back to Amir's comment about 
the Lucy trophy related to Miller loan. Okay, and and there again, I've looked hard for that, and there 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 is none. And I think the challenge is trying to disentangle changes in afterload and intrinsic changes in relaxation of the myocardium, and it will be probably very difficult to do it in 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 a in a human setting. But I actually want to ask a question to the panel, which is something that is commonly said and commonly reported, particularly by pediatric cardiologists and pediatric ICU intensivists, uh, which is that vasopressin is contraindicated with LV dysfunction. Okay, I, I have never seen a report of it. I've never seen any evidence in the newborn uh, kind of justifying that we use it commonly in infants that may have some LV dysfunction in the setting of pulmonary hypertension and have never seen a deterioration. We, we've, we've even used it in a baby that actually had a primary LV disease uh, who was very hypotensive and the, op, the augmentation of coronary perfusion actually led to, to, to recovery. So it's one of those things, again, with the, the whole lucytropy thing, it's, it's interesting. People make very dogmatic statements sometimes but there's actually very little evidence to, to support some of them. So I'm just curious to know who else here has heard that perspective and have you any personal experience or seen any evidence to, to support that? And that can be to anybody. So I see Alan has his hand up, so I'll, I'll start with him and then and then we'll go around. Yeah, thanks. I, I, I don't have enough. I don't, I haven't seen data, I agree. And I think my point is to keep pulling us away from any of these rules, any of this standard uh, interpretation that we can always treat things in the same way. You saw uh, Amir at the center of his slides had this notion of preload contractility afterload. That's still our scaffold by which we should be assessing circulatory failure in our babies and manipulating each bit bit of those physiology but there's a few other things that are on there and i i agree with patrick if the issue is that you think there isn't enough diastolic systemic vascular resistance to force blood through the coronary arteries into the myocardium then you need to slow the heart down a little bit and increase your s and, and increase your svr but of course you don't want to do that too much because the more you put up your SVR, particularly during Sicily, the more afterload you're putting on the failing mm -hmm. left ventricle. So this is all a balancing act. But I, rather than anybody ever, unfortunately, thinking that there's a one word answer to this problem, there never seems to be a one word answer to this problem. I think the best that we can do is make sure we're splitting down the circulatory function into its component parts, mostly preload contractility afterload, but also fetal shunts also relaxation, also heart rate, and also coronary perfusion to then decide which of those elements of the physiology we're trying to manipulate with our intervention. Great. Paul, any, any thoughts? And uh, we'll probably come back to your questions that you had um, for Amir, and then we'll, we'll turn, turn our attention back to the Q&A chat here. Oh, no, I just I I just wanted to go back to what um Patrick and Alan has has mentioned and I'm, Amir has like um gracefully like emphasized in this talk. I think there are cautions in all of the um cardiovascular medications that we use. We just have to have the knowledge of when to use it, how to use it, and like the the whole the whole like dance of when is the right time to complement something. Because I think we just had a baby with um, severe um, cardiomyopathy as well as sepsis. So we did have to use vasopressin to increase the um, diastolic blood pressure as well as um, increase coronary perfusion. And we actually added mirinone like at some point as well. But I, in saying those, I think it just go back to knowing your patient population knowing what to look for when you do um, hemodynamic assessment and which drug to use at what time, so. Great. Um, so I see there is a question on the chat and maybe I can I can direct this to Amir. Um, uh, the, the question is around the management of arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. So that is something that we didn't really touch upon too much 
Um, the question was, can I discuss the management of arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy with depressed function, hypotension, and difficult to control arrhythmia? Any thoughts? Yes, I intentionally didn't talk about that one, uh, mostly because I only had 30 minutes and I even went over as is. But no, arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy definitely is real. We definitely do see it from time to time. And just to take something, it, well, let's break it down. What type of arrhythmia is this? Are we talking about an atrial arrhythmia? Are we talking about a ventricular arrhythmia? So step number one is identify where the arrhythmogenic source is and do your best to treat that. Now we have had uh, only two cases that I can think of during my career where despite maximum medical management, ultimately the baby did need to go on to ECMO until we could get drug doses high enough that we could stop the uh, arrhythmias. So what is the mechanism or what is the treatment algorithm? Of course, identify what the source of the, uh, the arrhythmia is, treat that best you can. Of course, we don't have a lot of experience in some of the exotic antiarrhythmic drugs. So that's where your EP uh, colleague is your best friend and just sitting right on your, uh, sitting right on your hip, going back and forth. Of course, making sure everything comes down to your DO2 to VO2 relationship, reduce myocardial oxygen, uh, reduce uh, body's demand for oxygen, optimizes delivery. I think we discussed that quite nightly. And worst case scenario, like I said, sometimes you need ECMO in the meantime, but that's real briefly how I would address that. Great. Um, so coming back to the, the issue around preterm infants again. So there was a question on use of DART, dexamethasone, and diastolic dysfunction. Do you notice any trends in DART courses and diastolic dysfunction, either immediate or later on in your unit? Uh, maybe, Danielle, I can direct this to you. Sorry. <laughs> um which the so we do um we do use darts uh in our units and i'm just trying to kind of think back to see if i can make any correlations with dart use and diastolic dysfunction but um but i don't know if it's because we use it so often that um that it's clouded by the fact that um we oftentimes correlate more, um, you know, like pulmonary overcirculation issues, like in a patient with a PDA or something where their pulmonary vascular resistance is decreased when they are on DART. And we see those kinds of things more, um, you know, but that also leads to the fact that if they have maybe a big ASD or something like that, then steroids can decrease that as well and, and increase the, the shunt um, for that left-sided pressure. But I don't know that, uh, that I can talk intelligently about the trends that if we've seen those trends at the moment, but, but yes, we do use a lot of DART, but we also get a lot of hemodynamics consultation. So none of these kids kind of get um, lost in the mix. Um, we're watching them very closely to make sure that they don't have any adverse effects from DART use. Any yeah, I guess I would else? jump in that I think yeah. that um, I certainly can't think of evidence on dart causing problematic uh diastolic dysfunction it clearly does extraordinary things to your overall circulatory function um as with the standard dart dose i have to say we don't often see too many problems with it uh but at our bigger dex doses those of us who are old enough to remember those doses will remember that we always used to see these kids getting profoundly bradycardic during their their dex dosing here's heart rate uh happening sort of 24 48 hours after your high dose dex starting and we often see these kids heart rates down in the you know 80s and 90s when they were in the 160s dex dex at decent doses does extraordinary things to your function i guess my my hunch would be that if you've got a bit of diastolic dysfunction with it, it's probably a relatively minor issue compared to all the other things that are happening with your circulatory function. I don't remember ever having to think that I had to do anything for it. Great. Now, I, I know we are coming up to 15 minutes over the hour, and it's been a wonderful discussion. We still have a lot of questions, but maybe I'll just put one more because that is fairly common in um, in our day-to-day -day practice. And that is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy uh, in a baby born to an infant of, or baby born to a diabetic mom and the role of propranolol. Um, 
So maybe I can direct that to Jenny. Um, any thoughts on, on the utility of propranolol or beta blockers in general in this situation? Um, well, yeah, I believe that's what we're traditionally taught is that we should be um, slowing. Well, actually, I guess that's also what Amir was um, uh, educating everyone about too, is that uh, we should be uh, using propranolol uh, for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, I think it's hard for, um, you know, I think it's hard for us to think that way because if the, if you have a um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy that's actually looking like you're starting to get poor perfusion, I think people's inclination when they see a baby who looks shocky is to try to give something um, that is a, that will increase your blood pressure and, and things like that, but that would be the wrong thing to do um, in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So that's just sort of a way you have to Think about it, beta blockers. We might have a, a, a little bit of a different um, approach to, to that. Like, so in our babies that have um, the, the IDMers that have um, a lot of hypertrophy, uh, we first use volume. <laughs> like, you just put more volume into the heart. Um, that tends to help. And then also we do try, because of the pressure being kind of so high in the left ventricle, we do try to equilibrate the pressure um, from the like aorta um, across the aortic valve, essentially, that we tend to see it kind of slows down. Um, so it allows more feeling um, when there's less gradient between the two. Um, and so we do sometimes start something like a vasopressin or something like that to, to get that blood pressure kind of up to get that um, pressure gradient to be less. Um, and we tend to see that that helps them with the filling. If that doesn't work, then we consider uh, beta blockers, but it's definitely not our first line I, like therapy, I would say here at least. So that makes sense, uh, Danielle. I think um, vasopressin is a choice that um, that definitely would help with going on. I think I was thinking more of something that will speed up the heart, but vasopressin won't do that. So that makes sense. Yeah, we absolutely avoid those, hundred <laughs> percent. Wonderful. Um, any concluding thoughts from any uh, any of the panelists or um, Amir? Uh, on any of the issues that we discussed or we didn't have time to discuss. Nothing on my end. Thank you, uh, Shovik. Thank you, Pearl, for moderating. I had a great time. And thanks to the NH NHRC for the invitation to speak. It's a real privilege. Yeah, I know it's been, it's been an absolute pleasure having everyone here. And again, um, thanks for the shout out to right at the outset of your talk on when to intubate versus we spend so much of time and on when not to intubate. So thanks again for the shout out there. Uh, it has been an absolute pleasure having everyone on, um, on this discussion today and until our next NHRC meeting, be well. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank Great you. job, Amir. <laughs>